afternoon and welcome everyone to today's Smart Start webinar. I'm Callie Waterhouse with the Arizona Association of Realtors and we're proud to bring you these free monthly webinars designed exclusively for Arizona Realtors. Today's webinar is the conclusion in our continuing series, Effective Buyer Counseling with Evan Fuchs. Evan is a top producing broker, trainer, and real estate leader who dedicates his time to raising the bar in real estate education by serving at the local, state, and national levels. Evan teaches pre-licensing and continuing education statewide, including designation and certification courses such as ABR, GRI, SRF, and EPRO. Today's webinar is part three in a three-part series. Part one for the Realtor is available on our website. Part two, all about the buyer, is also available on the website. And today's part three, Evan will be talking about the Realtor-Buyer relationship. So with that being said, welcome Evan. Well, hello Callie, how are you doing? We're doing good, how about you? Good, good. I wanted to say thank you to you and to everybody for uh, coming back for part three in this series, or if you're joining us for the first time, it's great to be here with you. Okay, very good. So, um, as Callie mentioned, this being part three, I just wanted to give a, a little bit of a review and then um, kind of bring everybody else up to speed who maybe wasn't with us for one of the other two parts. Uh, in part one, we talked about um, what's in it for the realtor, and the reason that we started with that was we wanted us as the realtor to buy into the idea of uh, implementing uh, buyer consultation as part of our home buying process because we got to believe it first before we can uh, uh, bring it to the, the buyer. Then part two, we started focusing on the buyer, what's in it for the buyer, um, how to get on track with the buyer as far as common goals for the buyer consultation. We talked about uh, the DNA, which is the doing the buyer's uh, desires, needs, and ability assessment, and also setting expectations and ans uh, answering questions and uh, creating maybe some boundaries as well in, in part two we talked about. So today we're going to bring those pieces together and talk about the buyer-realtor relationship. Now, going back to part one, what we started was with the idea of the 80-20 rule. And just as a reminder, the 80-20 rule says that 80% of our results come from 20% of our efforts. So if you think about how that works in the realtor world, if you all the things that we do all day long, all the activities, all the work that we do, uh, effort that we put in, that really 20% of those efforts uh, create 80% of the results. And you say, well, what are we doing the other 80% of the time? And the reason that I brought that up on in part one and re I'm revisiting it today is because of this idea of what are we doing on purpose. If we have this finite amount of time that we're spending uh, in, in the universe and we decide to take a certain amount of that time and spend it working, right, if we want to get more results, do we want to spend more time working or do we want to be more purposeful or proactive about those 20% 20, 20 efforts? that are making all the results and can we move that pie a little bit by making a few changes. So that's the idea of the on purpose agent is to ask what are we doing on purpose in our business that's proactive as opposed to reactive so we can have some control over those results. And that was my question, what are you doing on purpose? How intentional are we being about how we work with clients? So for example, uh, after working with just a few buyers, right, you start to notice that there's patterns that come out where there's different stages of the transactions. Uh, buyers tend to have the same questions or concerns or similar concerns. So for example, early on in the process when you're working with a home buyer, uh, before you've found a house or gone shopping and we're at the, you know, the looking stage, the typical questions that you'll get are, how much is the house? Where is the house? When can I see it? those kind of questions. So by knowing those questions are coming, we can predict those questions, we should get really good at the answers, right? And that's part of the bringing us with the buyer onto the same track with common goals is anticipating the questions or needs of the buyer and responding with um, getting on the same track toward having a buyer consultation so we can address those questions 
and start helping them toward answering the question of how we work with buyers. So for you, what are you doing on purpose in your business? And that's exactly where the buyer consultation comes in. And we call the buyer consultation a system because we can look for these steps and we can create our, uh, our own steps on purpose. And then we can get better as we repeat. So if, we, if we're getting the same questions over and over again and we can uh, prepare for them and kind of measure how our responses work in the field, then we can improve upon them. And again, that is kind of recapturing some time because we end up getting better results. So here's how we do it. We're looking at investing a little bit of time up front by starting the relationship with the buyer consultation, giving us a chance to provide better service. When we start answering questions, clarifying the steps that are involved and uh, setting expectations and getting each other on the same page, we're providing a higher level of customer service than if we just start working with people kind of by default, where it's like, sure, I can show you some houses, and not, you know, um, and then uh, you know we meet them either at the property or someplace where we haven't had a chance to go through these steps. Now, you know, maybe we can't help that person, or we don't have a good understanding about them, and we end up wasting time in the long run. Whereas uh, meeting up front, better service, less time, also gives us a chance to build value by what we bring to the table in our home buying process. Um, and those things help create loyalty. When people understand what they're getting from you and they agree to work with you, we start answering that question of loyalty where we see, well, why did they go work with somebody else? Now, perhaps the most important thing we talked about over uh, in, in part one was the idea of using a buyer consultation as a way of staying safe by meeting with people in a public place before we get to know them as opposed to meeting a stranger in a private place. And then while we're doing all of this, it also gives us a chance to qualify the buyers and see how we can help them. And most importantly, do we want to? Are we able to reach a mutual agreement to work together? And I use that phrase on purpose, a mutual agreement to work together, because we need to keep in mind that we don't have to work with everybody. And not everybody is going to want to work with us. So the idea is this is a chance to make a presentation and get to know each other and the natural conclusion is to decide, do we want to work together? Now, by having that level of commitment of making a decision, that brings with it loyalty. You can increase the loyalty by reducing that commitment to writing using the buyer broker agreement, which we're going to talk about shortly. But just having this discussion, do we want to work together? will take you a long way. So think about it like this. Before you ask me to work with you, or ask me to sign a contract to work with you, I, ha I have to know what's in it for me. If there's nothing in it for me, why would I make such an agreement? So we address the question of value or what's in it for the buyer before we ask for the commitment. We put the commitment question at the end so we can do our presentation. Now here's a slide I'm bringing up for the third time. I've shown this on all three webinars, so hopefully we're driving the point home at, at this stage. This is from the profile of home buyers and sellers in 2015, where uh, buyers were asked, what benefits did your agent provide during the home purchase process? And then the, common, the most common answer that came up was help the buyer understand the process. And this is what it looks like each year. This is usually the most common answer is helping understand the process. So we look at this relationship that we have with uh, the buyer's agent and the buyer. We are looked to as the professional to help the buyer understand what is the process. And so the question becomes, what is your process? Everybody should have their own process for working with buyers that brings value to the table while also separating them from all the competitors. You know we've got like 40 some odd thousand realtors in the state. There's a lot of us. So what is your process that makes you unique and is compelling to make buyers want to work with you? While answering the question of what does the home, uh, how can you help with the home buying process? So keeping in mind that we're working toward that question of do we want to work together and with a little bit of uh, intel from NAR's report 
we want to continue to focus on value before we get to the stage of the commitment. So here's another piece of information that's helpful that comes from that NAR report, which is asking the buyers, what do you want most from your real estate agent? Not what's your bucket of all the things that you found helpful, but what is the number one thing that you want? Now, more than half the time, buyers say they want help finding the right home. So even with the existence of all the different search portals out there, homes.com and Zillow's and all that stuff, buyers still want help from us as the professional finding the right home. And that's, uh, I think this year it was 53%. But one in four, almost a quarter of the respondents to the question, what do you want most from, the, from your agent, have to do with negotiating. See, the number one answer was 53% help find the right home to purchase, but the numbers two and three answers, so you put those together, is 23%, help the buyer negotiate the terms of the sale and help with price negoci negotiations. That's about one in four people, so that's a big deal. We know it's very common that the person that we're going to be talking to as a home buyer, what they want more than anything from us is help, from, help with negotiation. So now that I've introduced that, I want to bring back this form that we looked at last time as a visual to bring some of these ideas together. So we're starting our process by meeting with buyers to do a buyer consultation. We know they want home, help with the home buying process, and we have a way that we work through our process that differentiates us from others, and we want that to add value. And we're using a visual because we know so many people are visual learners. Well, now that we know also that one out of four people say the number one thing they want help with is negotiation, during this explanation stage, we're going to spend some time on negotiating, talking about how we help them through the negotiating process. So that's what this middle section is for here, where we would walk through and explain what the offer process looks like, how prior to making an offer, we would prepare a market analysis for the, for the buyer and help them figure out price and terms that would work for them. Then we'll help them put together an offer strategy. And we're talking about this ahead of time to help kind of pave the road for what it's going to look like, take away some of the uncertainty, um, and, and bring up some of the things that might happen. Like, well, what happens if an offer is rejected? And what is counter offer? What does that look like? And what do we do if we get a counteroffer? Talk about that up front and how we help with it. And then that we eventually reach an accepted offer, which becomes a valid contract. So spend some time in this stage talking about what you do as a professional negotiator, knowing that buyers are looking for help in that area. And that will add value prior to asking the question, do we want to work together? So taking a look at your own situation and working as a buyer agent, what value do you bring to the table? We're going to throw a few more in in a minute, but I wanted to uh, take the time to point out that this serves two purposes by answering this question. Number one, we answer for the buyer what's in it for them, and we make it easier to kind of close the deal and decide do we want to work together. But maybe even more important than that, we establish for ourselves what is our value. But prior to coming in and meeting with the client, deciding for ourselves what is our worth and what do we charge for that worth? What, what, what is our fee structure? What do we get? What do we bring? What is our value? And there's a lot of power in understanding that for yourself. If you look at agents that believe in themselves and that their importance in the transaction, you will find agents that are presenting and negotiating with confidence. So that's what I'm suggesting here is figure that out for yourselves before presenting the question to the buyer. And remember that everything that we're doing from the first meeting through the buyer consultation, that's all marketing. The service that we're providing, uh, the, the, the presentation, it's all marketing. It's mixed together. The experience that the client has at the end of the day, informs whether or not they want to work with us again or send their friends to us. So the marketing and the service is all mixed together. So let's keep that in mind. 
Now, let's look at another way to be adding value and talking about it. If you are an Arizona realtor, you're familiar with this form. This is the ready form, which is the agency, real estate agency disclosure and election. Uh, we use this form to um, keep the commissioner happy and keep the, our designated brokers happy and all that, uh, complying with regulatory stuff. Uh, but there's more to it than that. And, you know, I'd like to flip this uh, on its head and say, well, what can we do with this form other than just do it because we have to? So first of all, let's take a look. As far as when this form is presented, um, you know, one option would be to present it right before you write an offer because you have to have it for your file. Or maybe commissioner's rules say it or the code of ethics says so. Um, and if you look... Uh, at the disclosure piece of the form, which is the first word after your name and their name, or your name and company, it says before. Before a buyer enters into a discussion with a real estate broker, the buyer should understand what type of agency relationship they will have with the broker in the transaction. So if you look at the flow of a transaction from when you first meet somebody to when you write the offer, when do those discussions start taking place? If we're presenting this at the point of writing the offer, it's pretty likely that we've had some of those discussions. So by reviewing this in the beginning during your buyer consultation, you take care of the regulatory compliance part. Okay. Now the next part I wanted to talk about very briefly is under the buyer's broker disclosure piece. It says a broker, other than the seller's broker, can agree with the buyer to act as the broker for the buyer. And that's what we're after during, uh, in the consultation is to agree to act as the buyer's broker. So take a minute and talk about this part here because we're working toward that agreement. And so let's use that in our favor. But the big piece here is under uh, line nine where it says a buyer's broker has the fiduciary duties of loyalty, obedience, disclosure, confidentiality, and accounting in dealings with the buyer. So as we're making this disclosure, we're starting to talk about what comes with the election of buyer broker. What comes with it is the, are these duties, and fiduciary duties are a big deal. Here's a definition from the Cornell University Law School. The Cornell University Law School says, fiduciary duty is a legal duty to act solely in another party's interests. A fiduciary duty is the strictest care, duty of care, recognized by the U.S. legal system. So at the end of the presentation, when I ask, do we want to work together, and we make that mutual agreement that yes, we do, what comes with that is a representative who's, who's held to the strictest duty of care recognized by the U.S. legal system. And so we should get some credit for that, because that's a big deal. So let's look at how we, how we break that down. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with the acronym OLD CAR, O L D C A R, standing for the uh, fiduciary duties, and they're listed in the uh, agency disclosure and election form. Now, there's two ways that we can approach talking about uh, these duties. We can explain, like, verbatim what they mean by law, um, or we can kind of spruce it up a little bit and talk about here's what it is and what that means to you. So for example, when we talk about obedience, a question, a definition that I hear pretty often is something along these lines. I'm required to follow your lawful instruction as it pertains to the real estate transaction. Now that's true. The duty, fiduciary duty of obedience does say that. But we can make that a little bit more exciting and we can make it when, we, when we're explaining these things, we want the person hearing them to say, yes, I want that. I want somebody working for me who brings that with them. So what if we were to change that a little bit and say, hey, you know, buying a house is a, is a big investment, and uh, I want to make sure that you know that I'm here to help you every step of the way, but in the end, you're the boss. You're the, ones who, you're the one who's in charge. I work for you. And what that means is, what you say goes as it relates to the real estate transaction. See, so we can take, and that's one of six items within that one line of fiduciary duties. 
so we can take the time to talk about what this means to you, um, what the value is, what's in it for the buyer. So let's try that again. Look at the next one. Um, oh, well, uh, for loyalty, we could say, I'm required to protect and promote your interests. But if we wanted to restate that and give it some more value, how about, I place your interests above everyone else's, including my own. So stop for a second and ask yourself, would you want somebody working for you, a representative, who says, you are the most important one here. I put your interests above everybody else's, even my own. How about when it comes to disclosure? We could say, I'm required to disclose material facts and information in my possession, which is true. Then we probably have to talk about what material facts means. Here's another way to look at it. You know, what I know, you know. There's going to be a lot involved in, in, the, in the transaction, a lot of information that's received, a lot of paperwork, and we're going to go all through all of that, but I want you to know that anything that I know, you will know, and I won't keep anything about the transaction or the property from you. So you see how we can start to look at these and, and dress them up into what they really are, which is value statements. I'm not going to go through the rest of them. I just wanted to put that out there as a way of looking at these and make sure that you're doing it up front before you ask for the commitment so it can help you get the commitment, which is what we're looking for when we say, do we want to work together? So asking the question, what value do you bring to the table in the last uh, 20 minutes, if you haven't done this previously, we've brought up a lot of value to address that question beforehand or during, you know, beforehand meaning before asking, do you want to work together? So now, with that foundation in place, we're going to start working toward uh, talking about the buyer-broker agreement and how we take that, that mutual decision to work together and put it in writing. And before we do that, I want to introduce this idea of the four agreements with the buyer-broker agreement being the fourth. So uh, a typical real estate transaction will involve four agreements. The first agreement is typically a listing agreement, which is where a seller calls up a listing agent or listing broker and says, I want to list my house. And they sign an agreement that says that the listing broker will find a buyer that's ready, willing, and able to buy at the price and terms specified by the seller. And in exchange, the seller will pay the listing broker. So that's the first agreement, is the listing agreement, and it's between the listing broker and the seller. Then what no normally happens in most cases is the listing broker takes that listing and puts it into the MLS. Agreement between the listing broker and the buyer's broker. And what it says is when the listing broker puts the listing in the MLS and puts an offer for compensation into the little field, uh, in that listing. If someone buys that house, the, bu the broker who represented that buyer will get paid compensation from the listing broker. So it's, a, it's a, an agreement between the, all, the list, all the brokers that are participants of the MLS and it comes down to the listing broker and the buyer's broker. But there's this little uh, twist that we throw in there called procuring cause. And that's what drives the MLS on our MLS agreement is the buyer's broker, the broker who is the procuring cause for the buyer who buys the house is the broker who's entitled to the compensation from the listing broker. And the reason that it's important that we understand what that means is that, you know, every once in a while a buyer ends up working with more than one broker. They might start with one broker and end with another broker before they write a contract. And so far with the two agreements that we've introduced, the listing agreement and the MLS agreement, the buyer has every right to do that. There's nothing that says, I can't have one broker show or one buyer's agent show me a house and have another agent write the offer. But with only these two agreements in place, we're going to have a conflict because we have two brokers involved and only one's going to get paid. Now also notice in these two agreements, there's no overflow of, of 
uh, who the parties are. In the listing agreement, it's between the seller and the listing broker. In the MLS agreement, it's between the listing broker and the buyer's broker. But there is no agreement from the MLS or in the listing agreement that connects the buyer's broker to the seller. So the buyer is getting compensated through the listing broker. The next step, the third contract, is the purchase contract. So listing agent or listing broker takes a listing, puts it in the MLS, <clears throat> excuse me, the buyer's agent uh, finds a buyer for it, and then the buyer and the seller enter into a contract. Now again, keep in mind that there's no relationship here where the listing broker or the buyer's broker are parties to the purchase contract. They're not. It's just simply an agreement between the buyer and the seller. But the outcome of that contract, when we close escrow, the listing broker gets paid based on the listing agreement, and the buyer's broker theoretically gets paid by the MLS agreement through procuring cause. So very often it's the case that we end up with three out of the four agreements. And the problem is, as I stated before, if you are the buyer's broker who started out working with the buyer but didn't write the contract, where does that leave you? And that's why I brought up the question about or the statement of loyalty a couple of times because um, you, know, it, you may have been in a situation once or twice before where you start working with somebody and they go to somebody else. Um, by doing a buyer consultation and giving, explaining how real estate works, explaining your, your process for working with home buyers, asking for a commitment, that will take you a long way toward the loyalty. Agreement can be reduced down to writing via the buyer broker agreement. And the buyer broker agreement is an agreement between the buyer's broker and the buyer. So we're going to look at the language of that so that we're all clear on how that contract works. But I just want to pause here for just a quick second and get a visual of these four different contracts and the, the four sets of parties involved in the contract. And what we're going to focus on now is the agreement between the buyer and the buyer's broker. So before we bring up that uh, language, I have to remind you that I am a designated broker but I am probably not your designated broker. So if anything I say here uh, is in conflict with what your broker says, make sure that you listen to your broker and not me. Uh, make sure that if you're going to be using the buyer broker agreement that you are using it uh, in concert with your office policies and how your broker wants this contract used. So uh, in short, TTYB, talk to your broker. Now remember that this is an employment agreement. So therefore, it has to be turned into your broker to be reviewed, just like an employment, uh, a listing employment agreement would be. So sometimes you run into the situation where these get signed, and the buyer's agent holds onto it until they have a sale, and they turn it in then, and that might put you past um, complying with ADRE. So make sure that you understand how your broker wants these um, turned in for review. Every employment agreement based on state statute says that it has to be uh, in written, clear, and amb unambiguous language. <laughs> it has to set forth the material terms, including compensation, it has to have a definite start and end date, and has to be signed by all parties. So if we use this buyer-broker agreement from AAR, we uh, comply with all of those points with state statute. So let's look at three specific pieces of this, and I'm focusing on these three pieces because um, these are the three areas that I think maybe get misunderstood sometimes. So the first piece is the employment section, uh, lines four through eight. This is where it establishes what you as the buyer's broker are agreeing to do for your end of the contract or the agreement. Uh, A, you agree to locate property meeting the following general description. Now that could be uh, land, it could be residential, commercial. You could be more specific, you could say uh, a house in a certain subdivision. Um, you could say you, by area, by size, however specific you feel you need to be. But in many cases, if you're helping somebody find a house, it might just say residential. Uh, 
B, you agree to negotiate, there's that word again, negotiate, at buyer's direction to obtain acceptable terms and conditions for the purchase of the property. And C, you agree to assist the buyer during the transaction within the scope of your expertise and licensing. So your end of the deal is help them find the property, negotiate on their behalf, and help them through the transaction. That's the employment part. Here is the buyer's end on the employment part, and it's really important to have this discussion um, as it relates to the buyer-broker agreement, but also if you happen to be in a situation where you're not using the buyer-broker agreement, you want to talk about how property viewings affect the transaction. So the buyer agrees uh, to work exclusively with the broker and be accompanied by the broker on their, their first visit to any property. If broker does not accompany buyer on the first visit to any property, including model homes, new homes, open house, uh, held by a builder, seller, other real estate broker, buyer acknowledges that the builder, seller, or seller's broker may refuse to compensate the broker. So, hey, Mr. Buyer, before you go look at any of these places, you need to know I need to go with you because if you don't, that might jeopardize the offer of compensation that I'm receiving from the seller, the seller's broker, or the builder. And if that happens, that will eliminate any credit against the compensation owed by the buyer to the broker. And that's going to make more sense in just a moment here, but what we need to do is stop and talk about, hey, here's how real estate works from an industry's point of view. Because we don't we shouldn't expect that a buyer or a seller understands it. Explain how the MLS works. Particularly if they're signing a buyer-broker agreement, you're going to need to explain this credit situation, but let them know. If you see an open house or a yard sign or your friend tells you about a place or you get a postcard or you see something online, any of those situations, I need to go with you first so I can be your agent, so I can represent you. Now where that becomes critical on the credit piece is in this next section, which is the compensation. So you agree as the broker to help find a house, negotiate for them, and assist them. They agree to make sure that you go with them at first viewings to protect that offer of compensation. And in exchange, they agree to compensate the broker as follows. So the amount of compensation shall be what you write in here is entirely up to you. That's for you to work with your broker and reach an agreement on what you charge. And then that's negotiable between you and the buyer. If the buyer agrees, they're going to sign the contract. It's not for me, <clears throat> for me to tell you what to put here, and it's not a, you know, a subject of this webinar because we all work for different companies. So uh, we're not going to talk about fixing rates. But what you, whatever you work for, that's what you write in in this space. The amount of compensation shall be X, or the compensation broker receives from seller or seller's broker, whichever is greater. So in that first line, we're not only establishing the payment amount, but we're also establishing that you can receive compensation from the seller's broker. In either event, buyer authorized broker to accept compensation which shall be credited against any compensation owed by buyer to broker pursuant to this agreement. Brokers, excuse me. Brokers compensation shall be paid at the time of and as a condition of closing or as otherwise agreed upon in writing. So here's how it works in English. The amount that you charge as a buyer's broker is offset by any amount that you receive from a listing broker, typically through the MLS, that offer of compensation. So if the amount that you receive from the listing broker is as much or more than the amount you receive from the buyer, the buyer ends up owing zero. If the amount that you receive from the listing broker is less than what you write on line 28, then the amount that the buyer's broker owes is the difference so the amount received from the listing broker is credited against this amount. So after I go 
uh, after we finish with this contract, I'm going to give you some scenarios for, for how to negotiate or options for the buyer on offsetting that credit difference. But I want to make sure that we're clear that the buyer is saying, I will go with, I will have you accompany me on the first visit to protect that offer of compensation because that gets credited towards any amount that I may owe you. And if it's as much or more than any amount that I would owe you, then I get all your services for zero cost to me. Now remember, we're not working for free. Whether you use this contract or not, we're not working for free. The buyer, by buying a house, brings money to the table to fund the transaction. And that funding is used to pay us either through the listing broker or through this contract. So stay away from that word free. We're not free. We're worth more than that. But make sure that we're explaining this compensation part correctly and how the credit works. And then let's look at a few um, uh, possibilities for offsetting that credit amount if there's an amount that the buyer ends up owing under this agreement. So some options when compensation offered does not satisfy the buyer broker agreement. So what we're talking about is if the amount offered in the MLS, for example, is less than the contract amount. One option would be for you as the listing agent, excuse me, as the buyer's broker, to ask the listing agent, hey, uh, you have X amount here in the MLS, and would you change that to this other amount, whatever it might be. It doesn't hurt to ask them. If they say no, you're no worse off. But at the same time, you can't not show the house because they say no. So that, that fiduciary duty where we're putting the buyer's uh, interests above all else's, including our own, we can't shop for commission. We can't find, if we're going to find the right house for them, we're going to find the right house for them. We're not going to say only if the commission is a certain amount. That's a violation of the code of ethics and it would be a violation of fiduciary duty. So we could ask, but if it doesn't, if they won't change it, then we continue on and we let the buyer know, hey, we've got a place that we think would work for you. Would you like to see it? Then the buyer has some options. So uh, one option would be that the buyer could negotiate a credit from the seller in the offer. The buyer could see a house where they're going to end up owing some amount based on the difference between their buyer broker agreement and the amount in the MLS or wherever the seller's compensation is coming from. And they could say, ask the seller to pay a credit in the amount of that difference at closing to settle their contractual obligation to the buyer. And that's exactly how it would read. So under additional terms, you'd write something along the lines of, seller to credit buyer X amount, whatever that difference is, at closing to satisfy buyer's contractual obligation with their agent. So, and, and that's a buyer decision. Another option could be the buyer could choose to pay the difference. So the buyer could still want to see a house knowing that there's going to be a difference and it's going to cost them some money, but they're paying for your services. One case where this is very common is uh, if you happen to have some sort of minimum commission uh, policy in your office. If the minimum commission amount uh, that you work for, uh, if you're looking at homes that would fall below that minimum commission amount, you might have a discussion with the buyer and say, I'd be happy to work with you. Here's, what I, here's how I charge and talk to them how the MLS works and they may end up paying a difference between your minimum commission and the amount that you would get from the MLS. Another option that the buyer could choose is just not to look at the property. If it's not the only fish in the sea and there's other houses out there that would work for them, that wouldn't cause them to be in the situation of having a difference between their contract and the offer of compensation, they could just choose not to see it. But those last three options, those are all options of the buyer. Make sure that we know that we are not the ones negotiating or, or letting commissions interfere because that's not our role. If we have a contract with the buyer ahead of time, it's settled. If we don't have a contract with the buyer ahead of time, what we're doing in effect is we're allowing the listing broker to choose what we work for. 
because the amount that they put in for their offer of compensation, if the buyer chooses, if the buyer wants to see that house and ends up buying it, that's what we get is whatever they decide to put there. So by doing that, you're giving up some control in, in the situation. So just to kind of recap, we're starting with a buyer's consultation. And we're doing that for a variety of reasons, including staying safe, but also to showcase our value. To showcase our value and say, this is what we do for you. This is what we bring for the t to the table. In the, in the process of doing that, we're leading up to the question, do we want to work together? And if we decide we want to work together, here's the contract, the written agreement to evidence that agreement to work together. And then we're showing buyers how they can then negotiate to address any differential in the under that agreement. And you would talk about that at the stage that you present the buyer broker agreement. So that's a really far condensed, but I'm, I'm hoping that over the series of the last three webinars that we've given you a good taste of uh, how implementing a buyer consultation can change your business. We spent two days on this in the ABR course, the Accredited Buyers Representative course. So we tried to pick out some of the, uh, some of the most valuable bits uh, in three basically 45 minute chunks. And here's what that looked like. Part one was the Pop-Tart Realtor, where we talked about, uh, or it was part one was the Realtor, where we talked about the Pop-Tart Realtor, which was uh, what can go wrong in your business if you're just jumping when the bell rings and you're not taking control of your process for working with home buyers. We also talked about how what can happen in your business when you do control your process and separate it so that you're not stepping over the line and making decisions for your clients. So we control the process and our clients control the decisions. We talked about the mantra, CITO, come into the office, where we stop meeting strangers in private places, but instead we meet with them in a public place, where it could be our office, or it could be for lunch, or it could be at the park, or any other public place you can come up with to help stay safe. And also we concluded by talking about the value proposition of the buyer's agent. What is it that we do that makes us central to the transaction? So that was part one. Part two, we talked about goals of the buyer consultation and bringing us toward common goals, getting on the same track. The uh, wants and needs an analysis, which we call DNA, the buyer's desire, desires, needs, and ability. Setting expectations and also boundaries. So answering questions, letting people know what they can expect, but for example, when you are available and when you're not available, starting that professional relationship. And then today, what do buyers say they want for their, from their agent? How do we turn agency disclosure into value instead of just uh, checking a box to comply with uh, regulations? And how to use the buyer broker agreement? And the, all three of these will be available on AAR's website. I'm gonna turn it back over to Callie. I wanna say thank you to everybody and I'd be happy to uh, take questions. Okay, well, thank you so much, Evan. And you know, sometimes people have questions and they don't know they have questions. So, of course, um, Evan welcomes everyone to reach out to him. Um, as he so eloquently said, he is a broker, but he may not be your broker. So always talk to your broker. Evan's contact information is on the screen. You should see it now. It's Evan Fuchs, and his website is bullheadlaughlin.com. And he can be reached at 928-704-6700. Now, Evan, I see that on today's webinar, we have a, um, a vast number of agents who are brand new to the industry. And sometimes bringing up you know, the buyer-broker agreement is a little difficult to have that conversation. Can you think of any way or maybe uh, a brief one or two sentence script that a brand new agent could say to introduce the agreement to a prospective client? Yes, absolutely. And, and I'll tell you what's most interesting to me is it's a lot easier with new agents than it is with seasoned agents who have been around long enough uh, to, to know that it's not used by everybody. So the easiest way to use the form is just make it part of your business. 
You just bring out the form and you say, here's how it works. Um, you should anticipate some objections, but a lot of times I think people get in their own way by not being confident in the, in the presentation of that contract. So, um, you know, talk for new agents, talk to your broker. Um, if your broker has a policy towards using it, you can always use, speak to that as being the policy that your broker requires it. Now, I, we didn't have a chance to do it today, but in classrooms when I poll people who are already using the buyer broker agreement, I think it's about one out of ten, about ten percent of the time people say they lose business over it. But the overwhelming majority of the time is you just make it a matter of course. This is what I do. This is why I'm good. This is how I do it. Sign here, please. It kind of sounds like it's in tandem with your value statement. Well, and that's why I spent so much time talking about that is absolutely because, like I said, why would I sign something if there was nothing of value in it for me? But if I go, yeah, I want to work with that person, if they understand the form, they'll sign it. Absolutely. And then during today's presentation, Evan, you talked about the accredited buyer representative designation. And on our screen, our um, attendees today can see a little bit about that. Would you mind just touching basis, maybe just a couple of sentences on, on what this designation is? Yeah, sure. Um, so it is the Accredited Buyer's Representative, or ABR, and it, it's a signal to other agents and to the public that you have taken formal education towards specializing in representing buyers. The core course is a two-day course where we start from the very beginning. So if you're new, we start from ground zero. If you've been working, if you're not new, then you get to revisit what it would be like. So you're either building or rebuilding your buyer business from the start so that you are, um, uh, like the part that we talked about here with buyer consultations, but we continue past that through looking at property, showing property, negotiating, managing the transaction, all the way through closing and after closing. So it's a great way to take two days and either start or re restart your buyer business and it's really, it's a game changer. It's really a game changer. I love teaching that class and that's why I talk about it so much because I really believe in it. That's the core course towards getting your uh, ABR designation. So for more information on ABR, you can visit their website at reback.net slash ABR. And then for upcoming ABR courses here in Arizona, you can visit AAR's website at aaronline.com slash calendar. And of course, where would we be, Evan, if we didn't talk about GRI? <laughs> so yeah, of course. At any given time, there could be more than you know 80,000 real estate agents practicing in Arizona. So we always wonder what sets us apart. And Evan, you want to give us your two cents? Sure. Well, yeah, I'll try to make it short. The GRI, that was the first designation course that I ever, or the first designation that I got. And it just completely changed the way that I looked at my, my job as a realtor. Um, and turned me on to the impact that professional development has in the business. GRI simply is most bang for your buck. Uh, it's very affordable, high quality education uh, on a variety of subjects from contracts to agency to client relationships, uh, code of ethics, the whole show. Uh, in fact, the ABR, that course that we were just talking about, counts towards one of the requirements for GRI if you choose to take that course. Um, so I can't recommend that enough. You can go to azgri.com to get all the information, see the upcoming calendar, and what the requirements are. And absolutely. And whether you're new to the profession or you know a mid-career realtor who wants to move to the next level, um, most will say that they wish they had done the GRI earlier in their career. That this is, you know, like you said, it defines your vision. It's practical business plan, um, and it's a great way to build the foundation of your real estate career. Yeah, and you know, the way that I say that is it's like buying experience, you know, so if you're new uh, or newer, um, it's a great chance to get experience from, from people who have uh, been around the block and share their best practices. Excellent, excellent. And of course, that website is www.azgri.com. And of course, folks, we want to remind you that all of our webinars 
are recorded and available online. Our upcoming webinars are available on our calendar. And all of our recorded webinars, we have an entire archived library available on our website. Um, it's an extremely long URL, so we've put a bit.ly on it. So it's www.bit.ly slash aarwebinars. And on your screen, you're just going to see some of our upcoming presenters. We have Holly Mabry, NAR's Nobu Hada, um, attorney Denise Holliday, Liz Recchia, and Beth Adams coming up in the next few months. Wow. Of course, yeah, it's what a great lineup. <laughs> <laughs> so, Evan, thank you so much for joining us today. Any closing remarks? No, no, thank you very much. It was my pleasure. And, you know, as I've always said, if anybody wants any further help with any of these topics, I love talking about it. I love helping people out. So uh, my contact information that's up there, please feel free to use it and uh, we can chat. I'd love to be help, more help. Well, thank you very much, Evan. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And we will see you again at the next webinar.